what I want to do is uh, try to reframe this whole issue from a point of view that is different from what has just been presented, which was a more technical kind of issue. Because let's face it, nuclear issues, ultimately the decision makers matter. The kind of decisions they make are political decisions. And uh, they are not really looking at, you know, the minutiae of uh, uh, operational plus and minus points. Uh, the key issue that I want to address here is, does BMD have an impact on the working of deterrence and deterrence equations, if I may say? And my answer is straight away is no, it doesn't. So the reason why I think this is important is because right from the beginning uh, of this particular phase of uh, missile defense uh, uh, being developed, that is in May 2001 when uh, President Bush spoke about his intent to build up such a system and uh, the, the Indian government uh, appeared to react quite favorably, uh, there was a major debate in the US and elsewhere, and also a major debate in India at the time, many of you may recall. And critics held that missile defense is essentially very destabilizing. Uh, some spoke of a cascading effect, you know, starting from U US to uh, Russia, and especially to China, from China to India, India to Pakistan, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and, and the basic argument was that Missile defense alters the strategic balance in favor of the state which possesses it, or a finer point, the, a state which possesses a better missile defense, and therefore con contributes to instability. Uh, this could work in two ways. Uh, first, it would affect uh, crisis stability negatively, because it would give the, pre uh, the possessor of a missile defense system, some incentive to strike first uh, during a crisis uh, in the, uh, in the con with the confidence that uh, it would be able to degrade the adversary's capacity to retaliate. Uh, a second order argument to this is that knowing this, the weaker adversary has an even stronger incentive to use its nukes use them or lose them is, would be the argument there. A uh, second aspect of this uh, alleged uh, instability of missile defense relates to arms race instability. And that simply is an extension of this uh, earlier argument, which says that once both states know that you know there's an advantage on one side, there's likely to be an offensive race because the state which is the weaker state will feel the in, will have the incentive to step up its production of offensive capability and given the operation of the security dilemma the the uh, advantaged states were state would then respond likewise similarly there may be a defensive race uh, and that defensive race may be a race to build a better missile defense system. Um, one could take it to yet another order when there could be uh, races to build better uh, countermeasures to, uh, to defense system. Um, <coughs> some argument has also been made that in India's case, it is particularly problematic because India faces two adversaries. And so the complication arises vis-a-vis -vis both Pakistan and China. And so this makes for a really difficult and complicated uh, situation. Uh, so on the whole, it's, it's not a welcome development for India to conceive of missile defense. Uh, my argument, I will come to that in just a moment, is that uh, you know, this, these arguments are actually don't, uh, are not really convincing at all. They don't really work when they are examined a little more closely. But first, uh, let me look at another aspect. There are supporters of missile defense in India who have also used similar arguments. That's very interesting. 
And one of the arguments uh, which was made, and I've, uh, I won't quote in detail, they're given in my paper, is that if India has some missile defense system, it will, quote unquote, complicate Pakistan's nuclear calculus and reduce its, uh, quote unquote, ability to indulge in nuclear blackmail uh, through proxy wars, in effect. So in effect, uh, you know, it will in increase uh, Pakistan's worries about how India might respond. And I think this essentially connects up, although the author does not say so, to uh, the whole notion of uh, uh, fighting a limited war under the nuclear umbrella. Uh, another argument in, by a supporter <coughs> of missile defense in India has, <coughs> is, says that uh, <coughs> given that India has a no first use posture, uh, which is inherently disadvantageous, uh, possessing, nu nuclear, uh, possessing missile defense, I'm sorry, would actually make India's deterrence more credible. So essentially, if I boil it all down, there are two couple of issues which both critics and supporters of missile defense are using to link, you know, uh, missile defense with uh, the working of deterrence. They are that one, in a strategic relationship, balance is very, very important. And second, that credibility is very, very important. Um, now, these terms, balance and, capabil and credibility, are, are so common and so ubiquitous in, in the literature that I, I don't feel the need to go into further explanations about them for lack of time. But <coughs> My point is that these fundamental concepts of deterrence theory are borrowed basically from a kind of uh, deeply embedded way of thinking that essentially comes to us from the United States because we tend here especially to lean heavily on American, <coughs> uh, <coughs> the American lexicon as it were, the American vocabulary that discourse has become ours in many ways, in spite of the differences. But let's look at history. Let's look at how politicians, political decision makers really work when it comes to issues of balance and credibility. And I myself have, uh, have worked on extensively on a comparative history of nuclear uh, relationship. And if you look at some of the major crises, let's take two examples to begin with. The Berlin crisis during the Cold War, 1961, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, better known to all. The Berlin crisis, by the way, was in many ways, I think, far more dangerous than the Cuban one. But uh, my point is that in both cases, the United States was deterred from striking in spite of having a much, much larger force than its adversary, in spite of having uh, you know, very quickly I could dig up that after these two crises in, in 1965, the ratio of warheads between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States was one is to nine. So there's no question that it was, in conventional terms, a highly imbalanced kind of uh, uh, position, apart from the general sophist uh, better sophistic higher sophistication of the US system. But in spite of that, as I said, the U.S. was deterred, and balance did not actually count in its favor. But two examples are not sufficient. I look further at many other such crises and relationships, in which case, the, in, in each of which, the actual uh, balance was even more skewed, more tilted in favor of the larger power, and still the larger power, sometimes having contemplated a first strike, uh, refrained from doing so. Uh, the examples that quickly come to mind, the U.S. Uh, against China in the mid-1960s, very few people pay attention to that now, but during the Vietnam War, a large number of U.S. aircraft were actually shot down by Chinese anti-aircraft batteries present in Vietnam. That, uh, apart from that, there were a number of uh, dogfights and sh uh, occasional planes being shot down along the uh, border between uh, China and uh, North Vietnam. Uh, <coughs> Third example, 1969, when there was a major 
conflict, Kargil type conflict uh, between the Soviet Union and China. At that time, China's force was a fledgling force, but and uh, we we know that the Soviet Politburo actually had uh, discussions on uh, on uh, the possibility of carrying out a preemptive strike, but in fact they refrained from doing so. And finally, uh, the U.S. and North Korea uh, in the 19, mid 1990s there was a serious uh, uh, talk and consideration of uh, possibly using uh, force uh, to wipe out uh, North Korea's uh, barely known capabilities. And I just quote to you here from my paper on, uh, from an American official who remained unnamed that uh, uh, as to why they did not actually strike. So uh, and, uh, the answer was, it sounds good, I quote here, it sounds good until you ask yourself the question, what good is a strike if it leaves their nuclear capability untouched? In short, there was that, what you might say, window of risk, a very small window of risk, which political decision makers felt was too great. And I think when we think about how imbalances are created and so on, we shouldn't get carried away by numbers, by technicalities, we should start imagining thinking how political decision makers faced with the prospect of pressing the button and possibly having hundreds of thousands or even millions killed within minutes or hours. I think how they think, I think it's very different from the way technical people approach this issue. So my point then is balances don't matter. Similarly, credibility doesn't matter very much because, you know, in 1965, the Chinese didn't have a credible ar arsenal to show anybody. The North Koreans never had a credible ar arsenal to show anyone. And certainly India and Pakistan, you know, deterrence at some degree, to a great degree, has operated in spite of being virtually invisible in, 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 uh, in the operational sense. So <coughs> that being the case, uh, I think there's not much to be said in favor of many of the arguments uh, linking, for or against, linking missile defense with uh, uh, nuclear deterrence. Besides, uh, we do know, I mean, that uh, there are other problems re relating to missile defense which uh, inherently, that is one, you know, it has uh, difficulties in dealing with cruise missiles. Uh, th there is the problem of how many targets you can defend. I mean, we often think of defending New Delhi and, you know, vis-a-vis vis -vis Beijing or Islamabad and so on. But really, from an Indian decision maker's point of view, it's not enough to defend New Delhi. You have to also defend Amritsar. You have to defend Ludhiana. You have to defend Jaipur. You have to defend Ahmedabad. You have to defend so many other cities. Can you really do that? So when it comes to the quantum of risk that a decision maker is faced with, I just quote one statistic. I, 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 use, I usually refrain from statistics, but this seemed to be an interesting one that you should all think about. And that is, according to one study carried out uh, a couple of a few years ago, uh, um, if a highly effect effective missile defense system uh, with a 95% effectiveness uh, would face a 20% risk of being penetrated by an aggress an offensive force of only four missiles. Okay, now if that is the case, and I am the decision maker sitting here and thinking that hey, this looks like an acceptable risk, uh, I think I would be very foolish, and I don't think really that most of us would expect our political decision makers to think that way. Uh, so it is uh, so. What about missile defense? What what's, what what use is it? And uh, here I just uh, hark back to what uh, uh, what Dean said that you know it's not it has some utility it can be used uh, usable uh, not hundred percent reliable but still usable uh, in case of an accidental launch in case of a renegade launch such as a command and control breakdown used by terrorists and so on or an even an erroneous launch in, in the heat of a crisis where, say, the enemy gets uh, 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 commits an, uh, an error for technical reasons or, or, or because of uh, perception problems. Um, <coughs> I think in that case, I think 
a state has an obligation to defend itself and its people. So uh, when this is not a technology that is inherently destabilizing, then there is in principle nothing wrong with deploying such a uh, technology. In fact, there is everything to be said for it as a moral obligation on the part of the state. However, again, I keep jumping back and forth. The fact is that this actual utility in practice would have to be determined by a some sort of calculus of you know the cost versus the effectiveness. I mean, what are you going to defend? How much are you going to defend? How much are you going to spend vis-a-vis -vis the other demands on your expenses? You know, people are poor, dying, hungry, all of that. So, <clears throat> uh, I conclude uh, therefore with with uh, with this uh, admonition that you know we should, when we think about uh, missile defense and its and its alleged effects on uh, on uh, nuclear deterrence, that uh, you know, this is an issue which is essentially political. I mean, it, it, used to be, it used to be been famously said that, you know, war is something that should not be left to the generals. I mean, in fact, if you ask me, uh, nuclear deterrence should not be left to uh, deterrence specialists. Thank you.